Washington Foreign Press Center's On the Record Briefing on the Legacy of Martin Luther King. My name is Jen McAndrew and I am today's moderator. First, I will introduce our briefer and then I will give the ground rules. Today's briefer is Dr. Claiborne Carson, an eminent historian and director of Stanford University's Martin Luther King Research and Education Institute. Dr. Carson is a nationally recognized expert on the life of Martin Luther King. Selected in 1985 by Mrs. Coretta Scott King to edit and publish the papers of her late husband, Dr. Carson has devoted his life to the study of Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement he inspired. He has edited numerous books based on King's papers, including the autobiography of Martin Luther King. Ahead of Martin Luther King Day to be observed January 18th in 2021, Dr. Carson will provide insight and analysis of how the legacy of Martin Luther King continues to provide a model for addressing racial, racial injustice today. We appreciate Dr. Carson for giving his time today for this briefing. And now for the ground rules. This briefing is on the record. The views expressed by briefers not affiliated with the Department of State or US government are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the Department of State or the US government. Participation in foreign press center programming does not imply endorsement, approval, or recommendation of their views. We will post the transcript of this briefing later today on our website, fpc.state.gov. If you publish a story as a result of this briefing, please share it with us. Professor Carson will give opening remarks and then we will open it up for Q&A. If you have a question, please go to the participant field and virtually raise your hand, or you can submit it in writing in the chat box. If you have not already done so, please take the time now to rename your Zoom profile with your full name and the name of your media outlet. And with that, I will pass it over to Professor Carson. Over to you. Well, I can't think of a better time a uh, more appropriate time than the last few months, uh, given the events of the last few months, to talk about Martin Luther King and his, and his legacy. I've been thinking a lot about it uh, as I've watched uh, the election last fall and, of course, the recent events in, in Washington. And I'm kind of reminded of, of Charles Dickens uh, writing about the French Revolution when he said it's the best of times and the worst of times. And I, I think that this would express Martin Luther King's uh, uh, view of this because he lived through another very tumultuous time um, during the 1960s. And uh, I, I think back on how he recognized that that time of momentous change was also a time of, uh, that had, um, I think, uncertain consequences. He could see that the passage of the Voting Rights Act, which enfranchised uh, millions of, of black citizens of the United States, was also going to provoke a backlash. And uh, when he spoke in Selma after the March, Voting Rights March in 1965, he noted that the denial of the franchise had brought about the segregation era after the Civil War, another time of promise when the 15th Amendment was passed, uh, giving Black people the right to vote, but almost immediately followed by the rise of a new uh, system of segregation, the Jim Crow system in the South. And in the 1960s, what King witnessed was that after the passage of the Voting Rights Act, there was a white backlash. There was the Southern strategy. Um, Lyndon Johnson and um, Martin Luther King both understood that uh, even as the, the nation was moving beyond segregation, uh, there was going to be a strong react reaction to that. And indeed, that was the Southern strategy. And I would just point out that the 1964 election uh, of Lyndon Johnson over Barry Goldwater was the last election that a majority of white Americans voted for a Democrat. It hasn't happened since. So I, I would also um, point out that any period of rapid social change is going to produce a reaction. And I think that's what culminated in, in this um, very eventful period of the last year. What I would suggest is that all of the social movements of the last um, 50 or 60 years, the civil rights movement, 
the women's movement, the gay rights movement, the environmental movements, all of these movements have been steps forward toward what Martin Luther King would call a more just and peaceful world, but they have also produced a reaction. And uh, I think in the last year, we've seen both that movement forward with Black Lives Matter protests of last spring and summer, um, perhaps the most important social activism since the 1960s in the United States, um, far, involving far more people. I was at the March on Washington in 1963, and I was so amazed to see 200,000 people there. But when I realized that young people last spring mobilized more than 10 times that many, just within a few days, I realized that something important was happening. And I think if I had understood King's wisdom, I would have also cautioned myself and said, you haven't seen the reaction yet. And I think in the last few months, we've seen the reaction. Yes, Joe Biden won the presidency, but it is also the case uh, that Donald Trump received more votes than any Republican candidate in history. And I think the events at the Capitol suggest that there is this angry reaction, not just about the election. I, I don't think that that explains what happened at the Capitol. I think it's a reaction to the rapid changes that have been going on with respect to all of these movements. That is a reaction of those who feel threatened at the same time other people feel hopeful and, and about the changes that are occurring. Uh, so we do live through this time of, you know, that I would say is a season of hope and a season of despair at the same time. And uh, so I just wanted to lay out that as, as a background of how I feel that Martin Luther King and his last uh, book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? Um, I've seen some movement toward community especially in, in the world, but I've also seen um, the alternative, the chaos. Uh, that's what happened at the Capitol. So, um, so I think this is a hopeful time, but it's also a, a time of, of great concern about what, will, um, what the future will bring. Uh, so with that to open, I, I'd be eager to answer your questions, whatever they are. Thank you, Professor. Uh, so we'll now open it up to Q&A. Uh, you have the option of either submitting questions in writing in the chat field, or you are able to use the participant field to raise your hand if you would like to be called on for a live question. This is a quiet bunch this morning. <laughs> uh, Professor, I know there's a lot of activities happening at Stanford uh, in on the actual holiday itself. Maybe you could share a little bit more information about what uh, you're doing to memorialize the legacy this year. Well, I invite everyone here to join us uh, for a webinar film festival that will take place uh, starting on the evening of the 15th and going through the King holiday on the 18th. Uh, we will be the film festival is um, human rights, uh, civil rights um, films uh, that we will be making available for free um, to anyone who wants to join the webinar anywhere in the world. Um, and uh, the webinar itself will uh, allow us to basically open um, the King Papers Project and the King Institute uh, to all who want to learn about its work. Uh, we'll be showing, uh, for example, um, news conferences of Martin Luther King during his lifetime, um, uh, a number of, of um, speeches by him. Um, so it'll, it'll, it'll be an educational weekend when I think everyone will benefit from, from seeing it and it's entirely free. 
Thank you. Okay, we do have a hand raised from Pearl Matib, Open Parliament, Zimbabwe. Uh, Pearl, we will unmute you if you'd like to ask your question. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if it's so much a question, but um, I know that the civil rights movement and the Soviet Union had a very close interlinked relationship during that uh, Cold War period. Could you share a little bit about perhaps what influence or what helped the civil rights movement and maybe perhaps Dr. Martin Luther King received from the Soviet Union that maybe either changed perceptions about how African heritage is perceived or anything of that nature? What, what positive things came out of that Soviet Cold War period and that relationship, that very close relationship between the Soviet Union and the civil rights movement? And is there any change now between the Russian Federation and the civil rights movement? Thank you. I, I don't really uh, accept the premise of the question. Um, I, you know, I, I was an activist and, and somewhat a, a, a leader in that struggle. And I know that uh, Martin Luther King and other leaders were very uh, sensitive and, and uh, worried about even the appearance uh, that in the Cold War, uh, the Soviet Union was, was helping the, the struggle. And indeed, uh, the, um, the involvement of even former communists uh, in the movement was uh, such a controversial and um, aspect that it led to uh, the uh, FBI investigating Martin Luther King and, and, uh, and being very hostile uh, to him. So, uh, so I think if anything that uh, uh, most uh, elements in the civil rights movement wanted to avoid even the suggestion uh, that, uh, that they were on the uh, communist side in, in the civil war. Having said that, I think that that fear of, of being smeared as communist uh, inhibited the ability of leaders of the movement uh, to put forward um, programs that could be labeled as socialist. And, and, and I think that that fear has persisted, uh, that uh, unlike most countries, we do not have uh, a socialized medical system in the United States. Um, we do not have many of the um, uh, protections of workers that we have in many other countries. And I think a large part of the reason for that is that fear uh, that anything labeled socialist would, uh, would weaken the movement. Uh, I know that Martin Luther King was himself very concerned about that. Thank you for that. Uh, I would like to now call on Alexis Buisson from La Croix, France. I can now unmute you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Jen, for organizing this. And uh, hello, Dr. Carson. Um, I had a I had a question um, about uh, Reverend Warnock, and more uh, generally about uh, the the religious uh, left today in the U.S. I was wondering uh, what was your assessment of uh, the strength of the religious left today in, in US politics? I, I think it's always been a strong element um, going back to the beginning of American history. Uh, you know, not, they wouldn't have called it the left then, they would have called it the, uh, the kind of idealistic uh, uh, people, religious people in, for example, the anti-slavery movement or the late 19th century. Uh, Martin Luther King's social gospel, um, I think, is um, was representative of that. Um, so I think that it's always been a strong element, and uh, it remains that that you know I don't think it's an accident that uh, uh, Reverend Warnock, uh, who I know well, um, is uh, the pastor of King's former church, and that um, this to me indicates that the, the church is one of the strongest uh, institutions. Uh, and when I say the black church, I don't mean every black church uh, is uh, 
on the side of the social gospel. You know, there are, um, as you may know, um, many black ministers who are on the more conservative side on, on many issues. But I think, uh, you know, Ebenezer Church, even under King's father and under King's grandfather, they were civil rights leaders. They were um, uh, presidents of the local chapters of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. So I think that, that uh, Reverend Warnock represents that. And, and I think another thing about it is that I mentioned the Southern strategy. The Southern strategy was um, designed to, and it succeeded in convincing tens of millions of white Americans who had always voted Democratic before that to move over to the Republican side. That was the largest movement um, of voters in American history, you know, and it was quite sudden. You know, people who had literally voted Democratic every election in their life suddenly became Republican. And that shaped, that has shaped American politics for a long time. So the, the fact that Warnock won, that two Democrats won in Georgia, a Southern state, I think suggests that maybe the Southern, Southern strategy has, its lifespan is coming to an end. Um, that's at least the, the hope, you know, that this, uh, but I, I think I'd have to say again that the majority of white Georgians voted for Trump. So um, I wouldn't, I have to caution myself against too much optimism about one election. Just like uh, after the election of Obama, there was many people who were saying that um, that, that represented um, the decline and demise of racism as a factor in American politics. And all we have to say is wait, wait eight years and then you'll find out. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take a couple more live questions and then I see we have a few questions that have come in in the chat uh, uh, feature. But for now, I'd like to call on David Smith from The Guardian. Uh, we will now unmute you. Unmute, yeah. Uh, hello, <clears throat> David yeah. Smith of The Guardian here. How are you? Um, I, I, I'm writing an article at the moment about um, a play called uh, One Night in Miami. It's just been turned into a film as well. I don't know if you're aware of it. Uh, it's, about Mal it's about Malcolm X um, and Muhammad Ali and others. Uh, I, I, I have heard of it. Yes. Um, I was going to ask you if, if you're familiar with it, what you think of it, but, but more generally, I wonder um, what, what do you think today is, uh, is Malcolm X's legacy and, and, and what would he make of America in, in 2020? Everything from Obama to Trump to the Black Lives Matter protests to, to Joe Biden. No, it's interesting. I, I, I read um, just over this last week, I reread uh, Martin Luther King's last book, Where Do We Go From Here? And it has a, a, a chapter about black power. And, uh, and as you may realize, uh, Martin Luther King was um, used the book to attack the black power slogan. And uh, he saw that as, as um, you know, not really a positive direction. But at the same time, he said, that it is absolutely necessary that black people gain a sense of pride, gain a sense of the, their own power as a people. <clears throat> so he, he was somewhat ambivalent about uh, the, the slogan. And, you know, it's, it's interesting that he, he was a friend of, of Stokely Carmichael who popularized that slogan, um, that he had good relationships with, uh, you know, I think that if Malcolm X had lived, he and King would have sat down and discussed their differences and, and, uh, and that might have lessened the um, negative impact, 
you know, because the white backlash against black militancy was a large part of the Southern strategy. And uh, so I, I, I think that that period of going in uh, the late 60s and going into the 70s when black power, black militancy was at its highest point was for King troubling because a lot of that involved attacks on nonviolence, attacks on him. And uh, so it divided the black community at, at just the time when uh, you needed to have some unity. But I think looking back, what I would, I would suggest is that every movement produces that sense of a new sense of identity. And the black struggle of the 1960s did that for black people. It gave us a no, new sense of identity. And that was the positive aspect of it. But of course, there was, along with that, a sense of despair, you know, that change wasn't coming fast enough, uh, that, um, you know, the, the, the resentments of the past. So you still see that today. You, you see uh, a sense of, of a new sense of identity coming out of all of these social struggles. And I, I guess what I would suggest is that there's always two sides of the coin, you know, that each group that goes through at that sense of liberation also faces a backlash from people who are made uncomfortable by um, people who were once oppressed, people who were once um, um, denigrated can now have power. Um, you know, now we have a um, black person representing Georgia, too, and you have a Jewish person. You have you have a gay person running for president and being a, taken seriously. You know, so all of these are positive, but they're also producing a reaction of people who are saying change, change is coming too fast. I'm losing my privileges. And um, that resentment fuels Trumpism. So that, that's where we are as a, as a society. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm now going to go to a question that was submitted at <coughs> writing via the chat field. And this is from uh, Beatriz Bula from the Brazilian newspaper O Estadio in Sao Paulo. Her question is, Professor, you mentioned that last year we had the most important social activism since the 1960s in the US. Do you believe it is a result of these movements and specifically the call for equality uh, that can lead us to understand the election results in Georgia and having the first black vice president in the White House? Yes, I think that's that's the general point I would I'd like to make is that I see what has happened what happened last year as very very positive, um, and I think it's the culmination of a series of movements since the 1960s, environmental movements, uh, movements uh, for gay rights, movements that uh, um, you know kind of represent the discontent of, of young people over gun violence. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that drew a million people uh, to Washington, uh, that protest. Uh, so you're seeing this expression of uh, people who are discontented with the way things are, want to see change, uh, want to end oppression, want to end uh, in destruction of the environment. They're and they want change. And I think that's the, the, the challenge to Joe Biden is that that's what elected him. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't this, a shift among conservative whites. It was, it was the explosion of energy among young people. And they didn't do this because they're Democrats. They did it because they're trying to change the world for the better. So the question for Joe Biden is, I think the Democratic Party 
for decades has followed the strategy of trying to get back what they call the Reagan Democrats. You know, the, the people who left the Democratic Party went over to the Republicans. But there's another strategy, and that is you mobilize these uh, voters uh, who represent change. Now, who are you going, as president, who are you going to try to try most? Are you going to try to keep that coalition together that elected you? Or are you going to persist in saying, okay, let's try to reach out to the, the Trumpsters and try to bring them back? Um, I would strongly argue that the former strategy is a much more, much wiser strategy, much more likely to produce results. And I don't think you can always do the, both of them at the same time. So that's going to be the dilemma of Joe Biden. Thank you. I have one more question in the chat box and then we'll return to uh, live questions. I see a couple more hands raised. Uh, this question is from Rafiq Gurbanzad of CIBC Azerbaijan. I will read the question exactly as it's written. In light of the legacy of Martin Luther King, how are his views reverberating among right-wing groups, especially among those who attacked the Capitol? Well, not very much. I, I, I would think that if he were still around, he would be a target. Uh, I, I mean, at, at, the, at the root of Martin Luther King's philosophy, though, was the notion of nonviolence. And uh, his notion of nonviolence was that you always try to turn the person who is opposing you into a friend. You try to, and, and, and I think that most social movements try to do that. They try to say two things. I want change. I demand change because the existing, uh, um, the existing policies are destructive, oppressive, so I want change. But I'm not going to focus my attention on hating the person who is the cause of the oppression, because that you want to change that person's perspective. And that's what nonviolence is. Um, nonviolence also is the use of the vote. I mean, dem democracy properly understood is an expression of nonviolence. It's saying that I want change, but I want to do it peacefully. And when that's possible, uh, but, I, but I think that what's so disturbing about uh, the takeover of the Capitol is that it was a response to democracy. It was, it was saying, I, I refuse to accept the democratic process. And I think that's, that's what's disturbing to me, most disturbing about Donald Trump, is that this is not new. Before, when he was running against Hillary Clinton back in uh, 2016, he said before the election, when he was asked directly, will you accept the election result? And he refused to say yes. That should have eliminated him from being a candidate. That should be the, in a democratic system, if you refused or even suggest that you will not accept the election result, that should eliminate you from being part of that system. Okay, returning to live questions, uh, we have a hand raised from Nikila Natarajan of the Indo-Asian News Service in India. Uh, Nikila, we will now unmute you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Professor. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not putting on my video because I'm sitting near a window and it's like looks really dark. Um, so my question really is about what does uh, Kamala Harris mean in this moment? I know she has herself talked so much about it. She was actually born during the civil rights protests. Um, she has 
frame that legacy. But for scholars like you, what does her candidacy mean? What does her ascension to power mean? Thank you. I think it's an important um, aspect of what has happened in the last year. I mean, first of all, having a um, female vice president is a, a very important step in making America more democratic, more egalitarian. Um, I knew her father, uh, who was a colleague of mine at Stanford. And um, I, I think that, um, you know, to me, her ability to achieve political success is an expression of the changes that have occurred in terms of, you know, the people think of the 60s as a time of civil rights change, but it was also a time of immigration reform, taking the racist elements out of the American immigration system that had always been there since the beginning of the Republic of who could be, who could become an American. And, you know, the, the Immigration Act to me was just as important in terms of shaping modern America as perhaps the Civil Rights Act because it changed the demographics of the country. And so I think that what we what we see with her election is that now you have at least the possibility for a um, for democracy to to work in ways that um, will result in a in a more humane society. Um, you know, she has risen quite rapidly in the American political system. And why not? She's, she's bright. Uh, she's shown her competence at, at every level. And, uh, and I think that that's um, going, that bodes well for the future. Um, you know, I, when I look at the last election, I, you know, I, I see two things. I see at the, at the top level, Joe Biden, who's kind of a traditional democratic um, politician, has been around for many, many years. But I also see some of my former students uh, becoming involved in the political system. You know, people like Cory Booker and uh, Susan Rice and, you know, others um, who um, have been elected to office. And and that to me is is the most hopeful sign because these people have grown up in a changing America. They they don't feel threatened by change. They don't feel threatened as some um, older Americans might feel that things are changing too fast. And in fact, many of them think it's changing too slow. And and I and I think that that's what gives me hope that the Democratic Party, and I think eventually the Republican Party, will recognize and accept the changes and, and not be forces of resistance, but be voices of change. Um, you know, and, and it's, um, you know, I, I think that as I travel around the world, these, um, these factors that are make this both a season of hope and a season of worry and despair is, uh, is something that's happening throughout the world. I feel the same as I uh, travel in India or travel in Zimbabwe or you know, Brazil. You know, all, all of these countries are facing similar kinds of challenges. And I just mentioned those because I, I noticed that some of the questions are coming from people from those places. And, and so I think that that combination of a, an upsurge of liberation, people desiring to, to exercise political power and participate in the political system and to and to have their rights respected 
and to and to produce political leaders who feel that they are servants of the people rather than um, dictators. You know that that's something that's a challenge that many countries are facing. Um, how do you how do you build a political system that respects the rights of women? That allows a free vote that um, allows people who are not of one ethnicity and you know to um, participate equally you know that's that's something that is a global issue and i think king recognized that and i think that's one of the reasons why his ideas have such um, relevance in so many countries so that's that's where we are. It's it's a to me it's a hopeful time. Thank you, Professor. Okay, I see uh, Pearl. You still have your hand raised, so I'll come back to you for a follow up question. Uh, thank you very much. So <clears throat> my question is, I wonder if you can help us understand um, an element perhaps beyond the you know, the, the oppression and so on that, that kind of was the root issues in the civil rights movement, but we're all mostly journalists uh, here today and in the writing in the media about people of African heritage, it sometimes has a negative connotation or negative way that people of African heritage are described by media, by institutions and by people in general. Is there, was there at any time during the civil, you know, early times of the civil rights movement, any time now recently, were there efforts to dispel, to change publics, the way, you know, the way people of African heritage are described or, you know, certain words and language that, is, that are used as descriptors um, to being lesser than. Um, are there any efforts uh, within the movement to kind of begin to change, educate, and change that kind of narrative, particularly also in the media? We see it a lot amongst journalists as we write and so on. I, I just wondered, is there any element of changing that to a more positive, uh, particularly in dispelling the negative way Afri people of African heritage are understood or perceived? Thank you. I would say yes, um, quite a bit. You know, I, I, again, when I go back to King's last book, uh, Where Do We Go From Here? He gets into that discussion of how the English language, for example, has um, so many connotations of just the word black uh, as negative and how any kind of liberation struggle is also a struggle about culture, about language, about um, part of black pride was expressed you know, early in the century of, of just simply capitalizing the word Negro, uh, getting rid of the N word <laughs> and, and saying that that's, that's not acceptable. And you know, you 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 see that with the women's movement. You see that with um, any movement that is about liberation is also about changing attitudes, about changing the culture. And I think that's what makes it so threatening. You know, part of Trump's appeal was that um, he wasn't politically correct, and. I think that for many people that drive, which they call it politically correct, political correctness, but I would just call it simple sensitivity to people like to be identified, like to have control over the way they're identified in public. And no group ever will accept terms and terminology and a kind of language that 
um, destroys their sense of, of pride and and uh, and you know makes them feel excluded and powerless. So um, so that that struggle, yes, that's been going on. <laughs> that that was a an element of the entire struggle for civil rights from from its inception. It was a struggle about culture. It was a struggle about who who determines how I am described and labeled in the society. Um, that's that's why writers, you know, people like uh, Du Bois and James Baldwin and, and Langston Hughes, and you know, that was always part of their message was, we want to speak for ourselves. We want to use our own language. We want to write our own history. That's why I am a historian, is that I grew up reading a history of America written by white people. And now we have a history of, of America that is more balanced and, and takes into account the perspectives of the slave as well as the slave master. And uh, yeah, that's, you know, that, that's what's happening right now in, in the sense of here I am speaking about American society. 50 years ago, I would not be speaking to the foreign press. You know, that's, that's, a, that's part of the change is that you have a generation of black Americans who speak for themselves and are able to be heard and able to have a platform and able to be um, broadcasters and able to be presidents. Um, that was the importance of, of the election of Obama was that now you now you could imagine what it was like to have a black president and um and, and you know that produced the reaction of trump i don't i i think without the election of obama in 2008 there would be no trump in 2016. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to call on Alex uh, from Tehran News Agency, Azerbaijan. Alex? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, uh, thank you, Jen. Great to see you. Uh, and Professor, thank you so much for making yourself available this, this afternoon. Um, I'm Alex Rafolu from Tran News Agents of Azerbaijan. MLK had a lofty but much longed for dream, right? Uh, you've made it, made it perfectly clear that protected civil rights in, in a country include, you know, the right to vote, equality in the public places, but also freedom of press, speech, etc. cetera. Uh, echoing my colleagues, questions earlier. I wonder if you could give us a short list of current examples of key civil rights issues that are alive and the most challenging in your opinion, both at home and also perhaps internationally given given our audiences. Thank you so much. I, I think that the probably the primary global <laughs> You know, there, there's a lot of global issues. I mean, obviously the climate issue, but in terms of, of, of social issues, what seems to be a concern around the world is what do we do about migration? Uh, in an earlier century, the United States was very open to European migration. That made American industrialization possible. You know, the Italians and the Eastern Europeans who uh, came in by the millions into the United States during the 19th century did not have to go and get a visa. Um, <laughs> and in fact, the need to get a, a visa was the result of a reaction against European immigration in the 19th and early 20th centuries. So during the 1920s, that changed. 
Now, we live in a very interconnected world. Uh, I can look at the area around me, Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley would not exist without extensive immigration. Um, the European community would not exist without extensive immigration. So the rich countries in the world have, have recognized that and respond to that by saying, but we want, we want to select who comes in. We do not want poor people coming in. We want skilled people to come in. And so I, I think that that issue is probably the issue of the 21st century. How are we going to resolve that? Because you can't stop migration. Um, if someone is desperate, they will do practically anything to get to a more hospitable place. My grandparents, to get out of the South in the early 20th century, if there had been a national border at the edges of the South, they would have crossed it to get to Detroit and Pittsburgh and New York, regardless of the law, regardless of the dangers. They would have, they would have crossed that border. And you know, when I think about just how here we are in the Southwest of the United States and um, people are closer than they were then. So I, I think that how people resolve this issue and begin to develop a humane policy about poverty, you know, precisely the issues that King was talking about during his time. He said, there are three evils in the world, racism, war, poverty. And all of that is mixed up in the issue of immigration. What causes people to immigrate? What caused millions of people to leave Syria? You know, all, all of these issues, and, and I think that was another one of his insights. He, he was saying that all of these are interrelated because the world is interrelated. And uh, how we respond to that, I think, will say a lot about whether the 21st century is going to be uh, peaceful or, you know, as he said, it's, it's either chaos or community. Either the world will be a community or there'll be a lot of chaos, chaos in it. And we've seen signs of both. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I think we have time for one more question and this has been submitted in the chat box from Masako Shimizu of Kyoto News in Japan. Uh, her question is, I believe that it, it is essential to know Dr. King's legacy in order to understand the US as a foreign correspondent, especially for someone like me from a country of not really mixed races. I wonder what Dr. King would say to see this deeply divided US country. Hmm. Well, you know, that's, that's what I always ask myself, you know, as editor of his papers, what would Martin Luther King say? What would he think about this time period? And I think that's what I started with in, in this um, news conference. Um, I think that he would see reasons for hopes and reason for worry. Um, I, I think that America, this country has narrowly avoided what he would call chaos. Um, you know, we, we had a, a relatively close election. We have a, a, a um, Americans, white Americans have for many years, many white Americans have resisted change in a lot of different areas. But the hope 
coming out of the protest last summer is that that wasn't black people by themselves demanding the end of police brutality and, and police killings of black people. It was predominantly on a national level, a non-white movement. So how do you put these two things together? The, the, the fact that, that um, a majority of white voters in the United States have never voted for the more liberal candidate in any election since 1964. And the fact that we've had a black president and we will have a, um, you know, a black senator from Georgia. You know, how do you put these two things together? How, how, do, you, how do you make sense of the, the obvious fact that 70 some million Americans decided to vote for a candidate who, who said on many occasions, I will not necessarily accept the outcome of an election. And we find ourselves at least some surprised <laughs> that he really meant what he said back in, 19, in 2016 when he was running for office. So um, it's it's troubling, but it, you know, so you combine that that hope with despair. Um, that's what King did during his lifetime. Is he combined hope with despair? Is that the only way of getting out of this dilemma is through an acceptance of of nonviolence, which at, it, at its basis is, is democracy at, at its best is nonviolence. Non, democracy is at best a decision of political leaders to accept the, the fact that they are servants of the people. They're servants of the majority of the people who put them in office and actually the majority of the people because you you if you were in office you would have to represent even the people who didn't vote for you so how do we get to that stage you know i think from the very beginning all the great leaders of america have recognized uh, how fragile democracy is that it's not the natural condition of mankind. Autocracy, domination, is the natural condition of humanity. That we have to struggle to achieve something different from that, than that. And uh, you know, so that's where we are. And we're fortunate to have people like Gandhi and. King and others who are pointing the way to saying there is this alternative, but it's it's um, it's one that you know takes a lot of courage to to rely on. You know, it's much it's much easier if you if you are worried about the political future to be on in a dominant position and be able to command uh, what you want. It's much more difficult to say, I need to persuade in order to get what I want. Well, with that, I think we've come to the end of our time. Uh, as a reminder, everyone, the transcript and video of this briefing will be posted on our website uh, within the next 24 hours. Uh, I want to extend our thanks on behalf of the Washington Foreign Press Center to Professor Carson for this really critical and timely perspective. Um, and Professor, if you'd like to offer any final words. I think I've said enough. Okay. <laughs> but uh, but I, I have a feeling that there'll be a few more questions uh, in the next couple of days. 
Thank you very much again, Professor, and good afternoon. Good afternoon to you.